to make it look like my hair was actually presentable. So um, please hang on with me with my with my hat on. And I apologize to non non Yankee fans. Um, all right, so we're gonna get going. So welcome to our uh, community, our May Community First Choice Council meeting. Uh, next slide, please. I think everybody knows most of the team. The one thing I do want to point out is we do have a new team member. Um, her name her name is Rachel. She's actually the one working on the slides today. So um, just so everybody knows, we do have a new team member. She's um, still learning um, and so doesn't have full assignments yet. Um, so just please keep reaching out to, to uh, the normal uh, numbers that we um, give out for communication. Next slide, please. Everybody knows kind of our mission. Uh, next slide. So today we really want, uh, we're gonna hit some housekeeping. We wanna give that CDOS CFC work group update. Um, and then we really wanna dig into kind of the legislation and really give everybody um, an exciting update about what's going on around there. Um, and then we're gonna move right into open forum. Um, so next slide, please. Um, please, again, as, as in every time, uh, we do uh, really need your guys' attendance. It only takes a few, a few seconds. Um, and so Jordan is going to put that link into the chat. If you guys could please just utilize that quickly and uh, make sure that we know who is here. Next slide, please. And remember, do not share PHI information. We are recording today because um, we do like to post these. And so it is important that we don't share PHI, PHI information. Doesn't mean that you can't uh, utilize um, examples, but please make sure that we cannot identify so that, that this is easy to post. Um, and then if you need reasonable accommodations, uh, please contact John Barry. Um, and next slide, please. And then, and then from here on, I'm gonna kick it over to Eileen. Um, thanks everybody. Great, thanks Adam. Uh, this is Eileen Saunders with the department. So for any of you who are new to our CFC council today, welcome. We're very happy to have you. Uh, we just wanna give a brief overview of community first choice for any of you who are new. Um, we've you know been working on this program for for over a year now, but um, it's always good to to review kind of the basics and and where CFC lives um, within the Medicaid system. So, Community First Choice is an optional state plan program that was uh, enacted by the Affordable Care Act in 2011. It allows states to take a certain set of home and community-based services um, out of the waiver programs where they exist at the top of that pyramid on the slide uh, for only a select, uh, a select number of, of waivers and therefore Medicaid participants. Um, so CFC allows us to take some of those services out of the waivers and put them into CFC. And CFC lives within the state plan. So the services that Colorado is going to be moving from the waivers to Community First Choice are listed on the left side of that slide there. Um, we're moving homemaker, personal care, health maintenance activities, acquisition maintenance and enhancement of skills, which is a new uh, service that CFC requires, remote sports, remote sports technology, uh, all the transition services, so life skills training, your mentorship, transition setup, and home delivered meals, and then the electronic monitoring services. So personal emergency response system and medication reminders. We are also moving over our two participant directed uh, self-direction models, CDOS and IHSS. Can see, <laughs> yes, Christy, of course. Um, so we, those stand for um, consumer directed attendance support services. CDOS, and then in-home support services, IHSS. Both of those are moving over to CFC as well. So putting it all together, essentially by moving these two service delivery models and this set of services over to CFC, we are opening up access to these models and these services to all the waiver members and to more folks who are um, on the state plan. 
And I just said, see Megan Bowser on these slides. Can you specify adult versus pediatric um, since pediatric personal care isn't moving over? Yes, Megan, we can do that in the future. We just wanted to put kind of our basic CFC um, pyramid over the slide on here um, for now, but we can certainly do that. Okay, any questions? All righty, can we move to the next slide? And I'll do the consumer-directed attendance support services work group update. Since Christine is out today, um, I will be filling in for her for the update. So um, the CDOS and CFC work group met on April 17th, or sorry, April 19th, so a few weeks ago, and covered the topic of training. So the work group reviewed training offered by our training and operations vendor, uh, which is Consumer Direct of Colorado. The work group discussed generally what's working, what's not working, um, and what's currently missing from CDOS training. And we also went over what the department can, uh, how the department can increase participation in training movement forward. Some of the key, um, the key items that came out of that work group discussion were improvements to case management training, specifically more time and information on tricky topics like skilled versus unskilled care, the URUM process, extraordinary care, and protective oversight. The work group also discussed making training more accessible, offering training and support in Spanish and other language, other languages in a variety of formats, including on-demand videos and audio formats. The work group also discussed expanding training in areas such as finding kids-specific issues and aging caregivers. Um, and then lastly, we covered increasing community outreach, so educating the community at large, um, such as hospital discharge planners and social workers about the CDOS option. Um, and offering support groups where members can learn from one another. Okay, so our next CDOS CFC work group will be um, May 19th from 2020, or sorry, May 19th, May 17th, I apologize, from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. And we'll have that written out on the slide uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, but monthly meeting summaries can also be found on the CFC Stakeholder Opportunities webpage. Uh, so you can always look there to, to see what we've covered in previous work group meetings. Okay, and I think that's it. So I'll pass it over to Maddie to do the legislative overview. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Maddie. I I'm with the department. Um, I work on a lot of our legislative um, stuff, our rule stuff, et cetera. Um, as people that have attended this, I've never presented before um, to this group, but wanted to go over the legislation that the legislature is considering right now. Um, so we know if you could go to the next slide, Rachel. Um, so we know that some of you are well aware of the legislative process in Colorado, but some folks on this call may not be as familiar. So we want to be sure to lay the groundwork, make sure that when we run through the CFC legislation specifically, that the process makes sense to everybody. So um, a quick overview of um, the legislative process in Colorado. So it starts with um, a senator representative wanting to sponsor legislation. Um, once they want to do that, the bill will be drafted by the Office of Legislative Legal Services. Then that bill will be introduced in the House or Senate, depending on whether the bill sponsor is in the Senate or the House and assigned to at least one committee. If the bill has a fiscal note, meaning that there is a financial impact to the state. It will go through the Appropriations Committee in both chambers. Um, yes, Christy, Schoolhouse Rock, 
is <laughs> is the the cornerstone of this um but um so anyway so if the bill passes through um the assigned committees it will move to the senate or house floor after the legislation has passed on the floor it will move to the chamber that it was not introduced in and the cycle repeats so for example um for the bill that we'll be talking about today it was introduced in the senate um and then it went through the senate committees the senate floor and now it's in the house and it went through the house committees and now it's up for debate on the house floor um so if it passes all of those steps it will go to the governor and the governor has the opportunity to veto the bill or sign the bill into law um, so next slide, and we'll dive into the CFC legislation specifically. So as most of you know, the department submitted a budget request for the CFC project back in November, um, which I think Jordan can drop a link for that in the chat if anybody wants a refresher on that. Uh, in March, the joint budget committee or the jbc voted in favor of the budget request and the request was included in the long bill which is they the very long bill that includes the budget for the state um and the long bill passed in april by both the house and senate chambers and is heading to the governor's desk by Jul and he has the opportunity to sign it by july 1st um and as we've discussed in previous meetings, uh, part of this budget request included funding for the necessary statute changes that will be made for CFC. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there are several, several reasons why legislation came this year instead of like 2024, 2025, um, which is closer to implementation. And the first reason for that is that placing CFC in state statute gives the department state authority to implement the program and it provides the department funding to get the program started. Um, second, the department will be submitting our state plan amendment to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services or CMS and our rule changes to the Medical Services Board in 2024 so with cfc in colorado statute both cms and um, the medical services board will see that the department not only has the funding for the program but also the support of the legislature to implement the program and finally um this bill um, include statute changes that are necessary for C CFC implementation to ensure that waiver statutes do not conflict with existing statute after implementation. And we'll dive deeper into all of these changes in depth um, later on in the presentation. But uh, for now, I will pause for any questions. Um, if anybody has any. Okay. Um, all right, well then we can go to two slides, Rachel. Yes, okay. So um, the CFC bill is known as Senate Bill 23-2. 89 um, and Jordan can drop a link for that bill in the chat if anybody wants to pull it up and kind of look through it as we're going through different sections or review it at a later time. Um, so the CFC bill, as mentioned, is 23-289 and it's sponsored by the entire Joint Budget Committee, which is extremely rare. Um, and Basically, our bill has a high chance of passing, um, and so far it's it's plowing through the legislature. Um, so next slide, please. 
So this chart broadly explains the components of the bill and where these components can be found. Um, so again, we're going to dive deeper into each of these sections and why they're necessary, but this table can be used as a reference if you're looking at the bill on your own time and want to know where to look for things. So on pages one through six, you will see the federal language for CFC, including mandatory services and their definitions. The option for optional services, consumer direction options that will be available, and eligibility for CFC. And if the bill is signed by the governor, the bill will take effect in July of 2025. So next is pages 7 through 15, and this includes the necessary repeals and amendments to existing waiver statute to ensure there's no um, overlap or duplication of services when CFC is implemented. So in statute, the following waivers have language that will conflict or would conflict with CFC and those waivers are the EBD waiver, the DD waiver, the CMHS waiver, and the BI waiver. So those are the waivers in statute that are going to be changing. Um, and the changes to these waivers specifically include repealing services and service definitions for the services that are moving into CFC. Um, and then, um, the statutes for CDOS and IHSS require amending statute for eligibility and reporting requirements to include CFC language. Um, and if the bill is signed by the governor, this section will take effect in July of 2025. Um, and then the final section of the bill is. Um, kind of just clean up from outdated HCBS waiver statute. Um, and it includes repealing the children with autism waiver from statute since that those services have been moved into EPSDT. Um, and hold on one second. I think there was a question in the chat. There were two comments, um, one from David. David said the bill takes effect this year or else HICPUF can't apply for the state plan amendment and work with CMS on the amendment. Um, so, and Adam did answer that question uh, in the chat. Um, you're right, the statute is there, but it'll say the changes do take effect in 2025. And if you have anything to, to add to that, Maddie. Yeah. No, I think that that covered it. Um, okay. okay, and then one more question is Christy Blakely. So I think SLS would need to be changed as well for IHSS. Um, so at each, we'll, we'll go, I'll, I have a, um, a picture of the statute that kind of Ex shows better than I can explain it. Um, but essentially, we are removing where it says eligibility for IHSS comes if you're eligible for any of these waivers. Instead of eligible for these waivers, we're changing it to eligible for CFC. Um, so we can, but we'll dive into that again. It's much easier. I'm a visual learner um, myself. But um, but yeah, so that that should help um, explain that. Let's, yeah. Um, okay, so we can go to the next slide. So, um, as mentioned, the bill only includes basic federal language for CFC rather than specifying everything we've discussed in these council meetings um, thus far. 
So by doing this, we leave more opportunity for future changes and flexibility with the CFC program and the code of regulation and with CMS. Um, so what the bill does include for CFC is the definitions for the mandatory services, such as electronic monitoring, health maintenance activities, homemaker and personal care. Statute also states that um, CFC must include these services, but it's not limited to these services. Additionally, language indicates that CFC will include IHSS, CDOS, and licensed home care services as excuse me, as service delivery options. Um, the statute also provides the department the opportunity to include optional services that CMS permits under CFC. And finally, the CFC bill includes the exact federal language for eligibility under CFC. Um, so next slide, please. So for the adjustments to the HCBS statutes that already exist, um, we need, again, we need to do that because um, there's existing language that would conflict with CFC after it's implemented. So uh, one example can be found in the EBD waiver statute. Um, and so that statute lists the definitions, definitions for services under that waiver, specifically the definitions for electronic monitoring, homemaker, and personal care. And since we're moving these definitions into the CFC statute, we need to remove them from the EBD statute to prevent any duplication of services. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is kind of the example that I was talking about. So um, this excerpt is from the CEDAW statute. Um, and on this example and throughout the bill, um, you'll see language that's struck through um, and that indicates any existing statute language that's currently in statute that's going to be repealed or amended. And language in all caps on, after the strike through language indicates new language that like that if this bill gets signed into law, that new language will replace the strike through language. Um, so the portion of this section that struck through is needed to be amended, is needed to amend eligibility to include CFC el eligibility. So this portion is referencing, of this portion of the strike through is referencing parts three through 12, which is the waivers that we mentioned. Um, and the part that's in all caps says, that says pursuant to part 19 of this article six, references the CFC section of the bill. So this example demonstrates the amendments that are occurring under IHSS and the CDOS sections of the bill to include CFC eligibility. Um, and this is basically just to refer the reader back to CFC. This doesn't impact eligi the eligibility categories that we've previously discussed in these meetings, um, but just wanted to to provide that as an example. And next slide, please. So as mentioned, the final portion of this bill repeals um, the children with autism waiver to reflect how HCBS services are currently pro provided by the department. The state dissolved this waiver and moved the services under EPSDT, but the statute for this waiver wasn't removed. Um, so since we're in here doing statute changes, um, we're kind of running this section as a cleanup um, to previous changes that have been made. Um, so then I will pause for any questions about anything that we covered or um, anything to that effect. Okay, we have one in the chat from Christy. 
I still don't understand why we don't need to change language in SLS and CHCBS. Christy, would you mind kind of elaborating what, what language you're referring to? Well, if we're changing, this is Christy Blakely, if we're changing the, all these others, EBD, the mental health waiver, brain injury, all of those others, SLS and the other waivers have that language in it, in them too. Does community first choice not for SLS or CHCBS? I don't get why certain waivers need changing because the language is there too in that and those as well, those rules. So yeah, so Christy, one of the things that we did as we looked through, so first off, yes, CFC is for members who are also SLS members, members who are CHCBS members. So yes, that is gonna happen. What we found as we were going through statute is that some waivers were much more broad in their language and allowed a lot more flexibility. Um, while other waivers, like the EBD waiver, literally had everything listed in it. So what happened, and I think what happened with like SLS is basically SLS and DD statute are basically kind of combined. So that would lead it to be a little bit more broad in the statutory language so that we have more flexibility to build from there. Whereas with other waivers, they were much more specific about um, specific, like, like I know in the BI waiver, it specifically says you have to have personal care in it. Well, we're moving personal care into CFC, so we can't have it there. It doesn't say that in the SLS waiver. It's just a broader language. That makes sense, Christy. Okay. All right. That that makes sense then. We're, cool. we're not leaving anybody out. No, we are okay. not leaving anyone out. Okay. And by the way, nice hat. Thank nice you. <laughs> okay. I think David has a question. Um kind of a follow on to Christy's comment in the chat, uh, because CHCBS in the IHSS statute, it specifically states the waivers that are eligible. So that may need to be looked at um, because of it going over to CFC. And, you, and you're gonna have to look at, are the statutes for CDOS and IHSS both being changed? to fit in with CFC? Yes, David. So all of them are being uh, changed around. We've it, it wasn't just us who went through all of the statutes in Colorado to identify these. these uh, this was a lot of work between us and other parts of, um, of this process to make sure that we have identified all of the statute that needs to change, including CDOS and, and, and IHSS statute, because language is different in different parts it meant that we had to change different things and in sometimes actually the language really set us up to be uh, more inclusive um and so you know read through the bill and and if there's anything super super specific um that you guys are seeing you know we we're always happy to kind of uh kind of on a like one-off basis kind of talk through why we didn't hit specific pieces of legislation because we this has been an exhaustive um uh thing so um and then also i'm just getting a note that um that part of the ihss correct is that it's on parts three through twelve um at, and the waiver statute we are replacing that with that part 19 um part for cfc so we are making that change in the ihss statute hopefully that helps david uh, I'm just wanting to make sure that we've got all the bases covered. You know, we that's all it is. Because yeah, we definitely do. I mean, the legislation is not over, no, overly specific in that way. You know, because uh, I've testified twice on the legislation. Because mm -hmm. uh, I originally worked on this stuff in 2019 with Senator Zenzinger. We had a bill ready for 2020, and then. Somebody imported COVID to Colorado. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, David, we have we have worked with uh, multiple bodies to make sure that we are hitting yeah, all of the statutes that we need to to move this correctly. Well, I mean, and we do have time in case we missed one. It's we have until it goes into effect. It's it's not it's not really all that big of a deal. 
you know, because it, it just all has to be ready and and in statute and effective by July 1st, 2025. That's, That's correct. Right. So, yeah. I mean, we've got next session to, if we miss, if something was missed, we've got next session to clean it up. Yes, we do. We do. And and I think I might steal this from Maddie, but to make everybody just as plain as we can say it, we are making sure we are moving all of the populations that we've discussed into CFC. That um, um, and that also meant that we have looked at all the waiver statutes throughout uh, throughout all of the chapters um, to make sure that we are. Uh, uh, moving language correctly so that so that we're not finding ourselves down the road um, out of compliance with statute. Great. So we have a question from Sandra in the chat. Uh, what if a client does not qualify for CFC and needs to receive personal care through the waiver? Um, and so to answer your question, Sandra, um, Personal care will be only available through CFC. It will not be available through the waivers um, after July 1st, 2025. However, um, the waivers have more strict uh, eligibility criteria. So um, there, would, there would never be a case where you would qualify for a waiver and not CFC, if that helps. Hi, this is this is Sandra. Um, just to kind of expand on my question, um, and maybe I didn't hear it right. Like several meetings ago, I thought CFC was going to have a lower financial eligibility criteria, only 150 percent would be eligible. Where the waivers right now go up to 300 percent eligible. So if someone is, you know, 300 percent or even buy-in, um, how? and they need PCP services, they just no longer will be able to receive them? So um, that that will not be the case. Um, you are correct that Community First Choice, um, the 150% uh, uh, federal poverty line income limit applies to um, CFC members who are eligible through the state plan. Um, but members who are on waivers, um, that is like a secured pathway to, to CFC. So if you were to meet institutional level of care and targeting criteria for a waiver, you are automatically on CFC. CFC just requires that you meet that institutional level of care. They, they don't, you don't need to show that you meet targeting criteria for, for a specific waiver. So personal care will be open to anyone who's currently on a waiver, aside from the children's waivers, um, since children will receive personal care through pediatric personal care benefit. Um, but for all adults on waivers who need personal care, they will get that personal care through CFC. And then anyone who is eligible for CFC through the state plan, they will can receive personal care through CFC as well. Does that help answer your question? Um, I think so. Yeah, it's just kind of confusing on the financial side, I guess. Because <laughs> yeah. we're just so used to the 300%, which I know was like three times SSI limit, not necessarily the poverty limit so or poverty um, amount. And, so. and, and Sandra, think about it like this. If you're a waiver member, so if you come into the waiver through buy-in, um, if you are a waiver member, you are a full-fledged, full-on, Medicaid member, which means you have access to the state plan, which puts you back into CFC. So that's kind of the workaround for people with higher income, the 300 percenters. They get into kind of the waiver and the waiver is actually their pathway back into the state plan. It's kind of a it's kind of a weird, weird cycle, but it, it tends to work. OK, yeah, I get that. Yeah, since they're full state plan Medicaid. So exactly. OK, exactly. thank you. Okay, we have another question from Kay Waldrop. Who reviews IHSS and personal care for clients on SSI but are in the financial threshold? Kay, did the, did the 
answer I just gave, did that answer your question, I'm wondering? I might need a, if they are on, okay, so if they are on SSI, they might not have a waiver. Okay, so I'm thinking the SSI um, eligibility group under the state plan. Is that, if that's what, okay, gotcha. Yes, so so folks in that category um, under the state plan, if they meet institutional level of care and they have an income at or below 150% FPL, they will be eligible for CFC. Michelle. I think I kind of know what Kristen Waldrop is asking and I have the same question. And if it's not, then I will just ask my question. So um, I understand that if a member is on SSI, they can still access state plan benefits through Medicaid as well as CFC. But the question is with now having IHSS and CDAS moving over to CFC, so other members who are not on a waiver would have access to those two programs. Currently, IHSS is initiated, reviewed, and submitted for approval by case management. So if a client is on SSI and they are not on a waiver, they don't have case management, who would manage their IHSS? So who would review them for hours? Who would um, coordinate with the IHSS agency and submit for approval? Who will be responsible for that? Do you want me to answer that one on you? That would be great. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, okay, thank you guys. That's really good question. If because they are so closely related it's still going to be the new cma agencies the case management agencies and one of the things that we need to be working on over this next uh while before we're actually um um, um before cfc actually is implemented is that is some of those processes and really nailing those down and getting those details out but this process the cfc process is going to be um uh, handled by the, uh, the the CMAs, the case management agencies. Okay, I think we're you. This is a suggestion and a thought process. Is mm -hmm. if you have a case management agency right now, even with case management redesign, we are facing a massive um, staffing shortage. Yet we are trying to move towards a one to 65 ratio of case manager per caseload. If you then in 2025 start moving, you know, IHSS and CDAS into CFC to where you've got a whole new demographic population that's going to be accessing these programs, you're now asking these case management agencies to take on additional caseloads that they may not have staffing for. So staffing is one issue. I think the other thing to consider is from a case management standpoint, when we're doing a long-term care assessment, that's where we're getting all of that information on what that client's needs are and how that would translate over to IHSS or CDAS. So if um, you have these other members who are on SSI or other non waiver programs, is it going to be a requirement that this quote unquote case management agency or case manager who is now managing this non-waiver member IHSS, will they be required to do a full assessment? Or how are they going to be, be able to appropriately um, justify IHSS or CDAS hours without an assessment? So as everybody and I, th I mean michelle too i think i can give you some detail but some of this stuff is also being um worked through and we're currently working through it and some of this is really um more about the overall process with the new see with the new uh, case management tools and case management redesign um but we are going to use a, a single assessment around the state um that would include you know um individuals coming in for level of care that would need uh, that would just fall under CSC and not just for waivers. This stuff is still, of course, being worked out. We're still working through this. And these are going to be future topics in, in, um, in these council meetings and those kinds of things is really working out those processes. Um, some of the stuff that we're kind of, you know, 
we, we need to get some of this other stuff kind of figured out exactly. Um, and the legislation is also a big piece of that is, is really making sure we have the authority to go in and actually start really working on making sure the system is, uh, is streamlined for everybody who needs to utilize these services. Thank you. I'll just I'll wrap this up so I don't take any more time, but just for those future topics, just to please consider all of the changes that are happening for case management agencies and the additional workload that's already going on to case managers and then adding, you know, these new programs with CFC. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Michelle. Megan? Yeah, hopefully this isn't too off topic, but um, can we revisit why pediatric personal care is staying in the state plan benefits and not moving to CFC? I was tracking this prior to CDOS being added and following along and tracking the logic before. But as we've said when we had these previous conversations, pediatric personal care is severely underused because the reimbursement rate is so low. And so now I'm thinking now that we have CDOS being added to pediatrics, that if personal care was involved, it was in, if pediatric personal care was included in CDOS, then that would actually open it up for families to budget an appropriate amount to actually make it a utilized service. I'm just thinking about these kids who have severe autism, who are getting CNA hours, who likely won't get CNA hours once the PAR is reinstated, and how we can help support them through this that's coming along at the same place and that personal care and that protective oversight are those big ways and right now it's not actually usable megan thank you and i know you are i know we will have this conversation 20 more times because and i, and I appreciate your advocacy for this we are by by federal statute not allowed to because there's some there's some weirdness with epsdt and us having to have uh, services separated from a CFC program. And we've been told that directly by CMS. Um, I think that some of the things that you are bringing up, I honestly do believe that there is other places to, to actually talk about those things that will be a, a better, a better audience within the department. Because I think like, if it's a rate issue with that, is there things we can do to fix it over there as because as a department, we, we have not found a way and we have not been given permission by CMS to move it into CFC. So the other alternative we have is to look at it from the policy aspect and from, from where it is and how do we bolster it up and fix it from there. Um, I think, you know, Christy's on here and, and CDAC is a good place. Um, Christy also would be open to hear where else maybe some of those conversations are, are being had as well, if you would know. Um, but Megan, also, we'd be happy to look um, and kind of dive in and see where else in the department that stuff is being being talked about and we can we can get you that information too sounds good i remember you guys saying it before but it didn't stick with me because i knew that it was uh there was a reason but we hadn't had cdos as an option before that mm -hmm. i just i really want cfc to catch those kids that are falling through the cracks and i keep brainstorming or what are ways that we can help catch those kids in this process no, and thank you, Megan, for, for continuing. And I'm texting with, with Christy on the side, so we're tracking. <laughs> I knew you guys were. <laughs> Eileen, go for it. And I'll just add, Megan and Christy, if you want to um, send me an email, I can certainly like help um, coordinate some of those discussions and, and see what we can what we can do. Um, you know, I I hear you, and I'm also like. Uh, wanting to, as Adam said, kind of explore what other options are on the table. Um, so feel free, I'll put my email in the chat and, and feel free to reach out. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. I think that's, I think that's it. Okay, we have, I think just one, two more slides um just in terms of next steps and what's happened so far with the legislation and then we'll move into um <laughs> then we'll move into open forum um so rachel if you could go to two slides i think yes this one 
Um, so this is going to be different than the, the slide deck posted online. Um, they're, they just, the legislature just voted through appropriations committee this morning, um, and we got it posted yesterday, hoping that there wouldn't be any changes, but of course there always are in a matter of minutes. Um, so just in terms of, um, what's happened so far, um, I just want to start out by saying that we really appreciate everybody's understanding with the department on getting out information on this legislation on such a short notice um we were given a really short notice and worked really hard to pump that information out as quickly as we could um so with that being said the bill senate bill 23 289 which is the cfc bill was introduced in the senate on uh april 18th and just a quick 48 hours later um we were given notice that our our bill was up for its first committee um two days after it was introduced so um we want to first give a special shout out also to um julie riskin david bolin and megan bowser for um taking the quick action with that 48 hour 24 hour notice um to testify for the committee um that was really awesome and we appreciate the support on that um so with that being said you can kind of see the table of how quickly everything moved um through committee it went through the senate within a week i want to say and it's moving through the house um probably by the end of this week um if it's voted yes but so far Almost every committee has voted unanimously to support it, uh, to pass this legislation. We had one no vote, our first no vote in the Appropriations Committee in the House this morning, um, and then TBD on when that will go to the House floor. Um, but again, it's moving through very quickly. So um, if you could go to the next slide, Rachel, I will um, show you guys the link of where you can find the bill um, and you can also track the status of the bill so when it's scheduled for the house floor um second reading third reading um and then once it if it passes the house floor it'll it'll update they usually provide the updates on the website within 24 hours um so be patient with it but all of this stuff all of the hearings the house floor work everything like that is publicly accessible if um you know they have a youtube channel and just an audio channel um that you can <laughs> christy i just don't want to jinx it for <laughs> christy says it will pass on the house floor i don't want to jinx it but it's looking great um <laughs> but anyway so you can watch it keep up to date with it all of that stuff when when slash if it passes on the house floor it will go to the governor's desk um and then everything will will take effect after that um so yes i think that was it for the legislation overview um if you wanted to go to the next slide rachel if anybody has any questions otherwise i think jordan has once one um tidbit to go over and then um open forum or open forum then jordan i'm not sure which order that was supposed to be in yeah i think i have a quick slide so if you want to go to the next slide please cool so yeah really quick i just wanted to hit on um we we went over this during our last uh council meeting but we are uh continuing to kind of seek input on the different um article topics for our wellness education benefit uh, we really want to hear from members, caregivers, uh, providers, agents, everybody, really, um, to see what kind of article topics are going to be most beneficial to um, uh, waiver members. Um, so we, you know, as a reminder, based a lot of these topics, they kind of live under these wellness dimensions. So it's mental, physical, environmental, community, and interpersonal. And if you follow, whether it be the, the form or if you want to follow the SAMHSA link, um, they have more information on what each dimension is. Um, but really, one of the big uh, goals or some of the big goals of this 
uh, benefit is to increase health literacy, help members um, e more easily navigate department resources and promote community living. So if you guys could do me a, a huge favor, if you could do the department a huge favor, we would love any input that you might have. You don't have to complete the whole survey if you have like an expertise in like uh, physical wellness or mental wellness and you just wanna you have some really good ideas there. Sub submit them through that link, or you can give me a call um, and we can chat more about it. I can talk about wellness for quite a while, um, but would really love to hear any kind of input that you guys have uh, on that. So I'll pause there. Let's see, we got a chat. Oh, I think we have some questions. Let's see. I'll take down that note, Christy, as a <laughs> submission. Um, and Dennis, I'll read this one. Just a note of kudos to Hickpuff leadership and staff. Appreciate Hickpuff being able to directly, openly discuss current legislation. This hasn't always been the case and seems especially valuable to this bill and program. So great job, guys. Um, and then uh, Megan Bowser put the link in there. Yes, I will um, drop that link right now. Any other questions or anything like that, whether it be related to what Maddie went over or the, the wellness benefit stuff? Okay, I think in that case, then I can kick it back to you, Maddie, and we can go to the next slide. Yeah, um, I think we can open it up to open forum. I know um, we... We really wanted to get out the legislative stuff because personally what we've been working on for the past few weeks um, pretty intensely. So um, kind of a quicker meeting than normal. Um, and again, appreciate everybody's patience, but we wanted to open it up to open forum. If anybody has any anything not related to this PowerPoint or related to this PowerPoint, um, feel free. And Maddie just linked a link to the PowerPoint um, if anyone needs access to today's slides. That is the most recent link in the chat. Thanks, Maddie. And, and I just really want to say, um, again, thank you to everybody who has been involved not just with testifying but also just within the council um and then all the folks have been here for a decade i mean the reason why we have not been able to implement oh excuse me the reason why we haven't been able to implement cfc in the past is because we've never there's always been a barrier it, happening with the statute if that was like david mentioned earlier covid hitting in 2020 um you know those different things and so this has been a lot of incredible work by a lot of uh, a lot of different people throughout the last decade. And so this is just such a huge, huge deal to uh, be in this final stretch with, uh, with the legislation. And we're just, we're really excited. And we, we just want to thank everybody, you know, here um, and um, at, for, for really engaging with this because we want to make this um, an amazing program for Colorado. So thank you guys so much. Thanks, Adam. Um, I just saw Cheryl popped a question in the chat. Will kids with SSI be eligible for CFC? So, um, Cheryl, as long as uh, kids meet that institutional level of care and the financial requirements um, for being eligible for CFC through the state plan, then yes, they will be eligible for CFC. To be honest, I'm not super familiar with SSI in general. That is a topic I'll take back and do a little bit more research on. So if you do have more questions about this group, um, feel free to reach out. Um, we're, there are a lot of groups under the state plan, so we're, we're trying to um, pin them all down uh, as we go. Okay, 
Cheryl, currently they are not eligible for CHC, yes. Okay. Um, and so again, you know, CFC does not require that extra targeting criteria that CHCBS uh, requires. So, um, you know, if that's if that's the prohibiting factor for those kids, then I anticipate CFC will be um, will be an option for those for those kids. Nicole wrote, is there a clear definition on institutional level of care? Yes, there is. Um, so institutional level of care um, for CFC and um, for our long-term care, our, our HCBS waivers, um, essentially means care that um, would otherwise need to be provided in an institution if uh, that care could not be provided at home. So um, hospital level of care, nursing facility level of care, intermediate um, care for intermediate um, at the ICF, intermediate care facility for individuals with intellectual disabilities, um, inpatient psychiatric institutions, all of those facilities, those level of care, um, those are kind of wrapped up into that institutional level of care definition. Okay, and Christy in the chat, SSI allows children with specific disabilities are presumptively eligible for SSI if the house, household income meets the Medicaid guidelines. So kids eligible for SSI will also be able to receive IHSS or CDOS. Okay, thank you, Chrissy. And then Cheryl, or sorry, Adam just popped um, our slides from last month into the chat. Thank you, Adam. Let me know if I didn't fully answer any of those previous questions fully. Okay, anything else? Alrighty, I think we can go to the next slide then. Oh, Megan did just throw a message in the chat. When will CFC services be finalized? Um, Megan, are you referring to when will we go live with CFC? That will be July 1st, 2025. no locked in as to what is covered. Okay, so as of right now, and Adam jump in, um, but we, the services that um, we've been covering, uh, you know, in these council meetings and in statute, we fully intend to bring over. Um, if something does change for some reason, uh, we will certainly bring that to to this group, to the council. Um, but I don't think, Adam, like we're anticipating changes to our service package. No, and I and I think just to add on a, a little bit, the, we are uh, looking to uh, submit the state plan amendment to CMS sometime in the um, summer of 2024, um, because that's, you, you need that length of time to go back and forth to CMS. So that would be one deadline to kind of pay attention to, Megan. And then also, um, that doesn't mean that that's like end all be all. There's still some work that we can do through uh, through rules and different things like that. But I would not expect a huge amount of changes over around what what's um, populations who are who are eligible um, because we're pretty much following the federal the federal guidelines. So. Great. 
All righty. Um, so as always, if you have any questions from today's meeting, feel free to email us um, or call Jordan Larson. Um, our email is hickpuff, hcpf underscore cfc at state.co.us. And Jordan's phone number is 303-866-3580. If you need any accommodations for these meetings moving forward, uh, feel free to reach out to John Barry. His email is john.r.barry, B-A-R-R-Y, at state.co.us. Okay, next slide. So our next CFC CDOS workgroup meeting will be Wednesday, May 17th from 1 to 2.30. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put a link to that interest form. Um, if you have not, um, oh, that link didn't show up in the chat. Okay, I'll try that again in a second. Or if Jordan, you're able to pop that in there, that would be great. Um, but if you're, if you haven't um, participated in the CDOS work group meeting so f thus far and would like to join, uh, we just kindly ask that you fill out the interest form. Uh, before and then we'll be able to add you to to the the meeting. And then our next council meeting is Wednesday, June seventh, from ten to eleven thirty a.m. Let me try that in interest form again. Okay, here we go. Oh, Jordan already got it. Nice, thank you. Alrighty, and I think that's it. So thank you everyone for, for coming today. Really appreciate your, your feedback, all of the questions, and of course the help um, throughout the legislative session here. So it's been it's been a fun last couple of weeks and we're we're super close to, to finishing that out. So we really appreciate it. Okay. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone.